well. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this session on climate change and the trading system. Uh, as you must have undoubtedly heard by now, the World Economic Forum has an initiative in which uh, uh, they are trying to uh, improve uh, global governance. And in particular, the idea is that Davos is going to serve as a, uh, as a part of the process in giving feedback to global agenda councils who are working on specific areas. And in fact, there is a global agenda council on trade and one on climate change. And so our hope is that the session will serve as an input uh, into that process. Uh, our particular purpose here today is actually to explore the relationship between the trading system and climate change. In particular, we're going to ask, uh, how can trade and climate agreements be aligned so that trade can actually become a driver of low carbon growth rather than carbon becoming a cause of trade conflicts? Now, we can get it out of the way. Um, um, in the best of all worlds, in fact, uh, what we ought to have is global agreements uh, on the environment that are effective and inclusive. And indeed, we should have an acceptance of the idea of common goals and differentiated responsibilities. And if every country ha um, uh, is uh, doing their uh, fair share uh, of mitigation, then it's not necessary to have uh, a border adjustment measures. So that's the best of all worlds. Uh, in addition, in the best of all worlds, we would remove all of the barriers that currently inhibit the flow of goods and services that are relevant to climate change adaptation and mitigation. But unfortunately, we're actually not living in the best of all worlds. And in fact, we face some really serious challenges. Firstly, um, we have recently the Copenhagen Accord. Now, there are a lot of fair debates about whether that accord um, left us with a glass that is half full or a glass that is half empty. But I, and my, my own view is it's half full. Nonetheless, I think when it comes to the trading system, the glass hasn't been taken off the shelf. Uh, basically, we haven't seen any progress or any form of agreement when it comes to border adjustment measures. And it turns out that uh, this poses dangers. Um, as countries independently uh, implement uh, their uh, commitments, uh, it is inevitably uh, going to be the case that there will be uh, pressures to make adjustments at the border if we don't have a comprehensive agreement. There are two major drivers. The one is a competitiveness concern. Firms in one country don't want to uh, experience an increase in their costs that their global competitors uh, are not experiencing as well. And the second is the concern from an environmental standpoint of leakage. If we uh, um, uh, tax ourselves, say the members of one country, and uh, try to uh, conserve CO2 emissions, it won't do much good if, it's simply, if this simply leads uh, others uh, to uh, offset those actions. So these are the two major pressures, and we've actually seen uh, in the legislation in the United States, for instance, the intention, if uh, other countries are not making uh, what are deemed comparable efforts, by some date out into the future, the intention then is to take some border adjustment measures. So that's going to be the first issue that we're uh, going to explore. The second question, of course, is the potential. Uh, the potential of actually exploiting international trade and indeed the transfer of technology uh, in order to enhance uh, uh, climate mitigation. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn to uh, you, uh, uh, Achim Steiner, and ask you what you were at Copenhagen. What do you take away from that experience? Where do you think we now stand with respect to this issue? I think the first thing that is striking is, to some extent, the parallels between the Doha round and the Copenhagen process, which may have surprised some. But in fact, as Pascal and I tried over the last two years in bringing our different 
analysis of the trade regime, the climate change regime together perhaps underestimated to the extent that the world is struggling with itself in reaching the kinds of governance frameworks that allow transitional, uh, transformational processes to take place. And in Copenhagen, you saw, in a sense, a process coming to almost a standstill because the focus finally was not on a big deal that would enable us to focus on the benefits and opportunities, but rather to retreat into the costs, constraints, and fears. And that you cannot address because some of these transformations are not perfectly planable. So the question is, what is a fair and equitable deal? And I think in Copenhagen, the world shied away from taking that next step. So right now, I agree with you. I think those who describe the multilateral process under the convention has failed, I think, are, in a sense, jumping into a conclusion that is dangerous from two points of view. First of all, I do not think it is true. And secondly, what are you jumping into instead? We have an accord in principle that I would say encapsulates some of the key elements of an ultimately legally binding agreement that we can move towards. We are in a certain state of suspended animation right now. On the other hand, those who simply dismiss the accord should acknowledge that as of this week, we know that there is a critical mass of support by many of the key countries who shape that accord and who believe that it is at least a basis upon which the process leading up to Mexico could move forward. In terms of the trade implications, I think one of the greatest regrets that the world should have about Copenhagen is that it has deprived the world of another 12 months of vital time, particularly in the context of the financial crisis, when it could have moved forward, not only because of the quick start funding, but because of the hundreds, and I repeat, hundreds of billions of dollars that I believe are currently in a sense, in a state of hovering around major infrastructural decisions that have to do with investment in energy choices, technology choices, mobility choices, and others. And that is time that will cost us dealing in due course. And that's where you close the circle back to the environmental argument. Uh, Minister Rashid, uh, as you look at what happened in Copenhagen, uh, how do you feel uh, from the perspective of a trade minister in developing countries? Well, uh, first of all, of course, as a developing country and in emerging markets, uh, I, I would like just to give the assurance that uh, climate change is becoming more and more uh, an issue. And I'm, I'm making that statement because that took a different path from developed world. Uh, the kind of challenges we face in our markets in terms of uh, elevation of uh, poverty, increasing, uh, increasing level of uh, income, development, uh, providing services, for many, many years have taken really the priority. And people, when it came to issues of climate and environment, yes, it was there, but it was not seen at the heart of the development in such countries. Today, there is a um, significant change happening. And as, as a minister of trade and as, as concerned about the economy, we have been involved in, in a number of initiatives related to what we can do internally. So we have, in a country like Egypt, we have our own plans in terms of renewable energy, that it should get to 20% by 2020. We have already commissioned a complete study on industry, how to reduce our emission and created our own targets. But we have seen in, in Copenhagen a big concern about how this issue is going to be used in, in the period to come in terms of liberalization of trade and the competitive advantage of some of the nations. And, and we are at, at, uh, at a concern that at the moment, uh, issues like border tax adjustment, they will carry some serious challenges because uh, we need to, to understand the rationale, we need to understand the fair price mechanism. We want to make sure that this is not going to be abused by some of the countries to be used as a protectionism tool, that uh, some of our products uh, and we, as I said, we are a country that committed to do, uh, to do uh, our role in terms of uh, climate uh, cl improvement. We are not going to be penalized uh, just uh, on, 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 on an approach that we are not fully engaged in. And, and that is a big concern because the priority that we have uh, from one country to other country is becoming more and more now. Uh, different uh, with the emerging market becoming at the center of the growth and development globally. So this is for us uh, a big issue. But at the same time, we have seen in Copenhagen 
a kind of debate which we thought that it was healthy. We know that it was not an easy discussion. Uh, but the balance of power was uh, shifting uh, every hour, every day, in terms of uh, between developed and developing countries. And as you said, there is a lot of that happening today in the Doha and, 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 and the parallel that is taking place there. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we are seeing a very clear intersection between trade, climate change, transportation, that we need to find the right governance model and uh, the regulation, the system, and the safeguard in it. That, at the moment, in, uh, from a trade perspective, is not very clear. So, um, Pascal Ami, uh, you, you, you're following all of this very, very closely, and I'd just be interested in your view uh, from the perspective of someone who's really concerned about the trading system. Uh, we are going, it looks like, if, if we were to keep the status quo uh, as it currently uh, stands, and if uh, countries like the United States were to say that unilaterally they want to determine comparable effort uh, and impose border adjustments in absent that comparable effort, uh, how, where would that leave the trading system? Well, I mean, you are correct that from where I am, I'm mostly interested in uh, preserving open trade and uh, opening trade. But I also have as a duty to care about the environment. Uh, the WTO constitution, which dates from 1994, says that opening trade is to the service of a number of higher values, including sustainability. So <laughs> I have a sort of hierarchy which we all need to respect. My sense is that uh, I agree with uh, Rashid and with you, Bob, that Copenhagen is a step forward, and I, which is the reason why, even from a trade side, I didn't join the core of a lamentation. There is the potential of a multilateral framework that may work. We're not there yet. We probably have a, will have a clearer view on Monday when uh, the UN will publicize what they've got until now in terms of subscribing to the Copenhagen Accord and the notifications that go with that. So my, my take from the trade point of view is let's wait to see how much of a multilateral framework we have and let's all try and get as much as that so that the temptation to go unilateral is minimized. So this is my answer for the moment. We all know some countries have a sort of a free rider syndrome in mind, which is what if I do this, others won't do it, competitiveness. At the end of the day, the big question is whether, again, go back to the environment part. If I put trade measures, what's the impact of this on the environment overall? So keep pushing for as much a multilateral framework, and then we will see. And second, of course, do what we have to do as a contribution, which is reducing obstacle to trade to environment, goods, and services, which is a mandated part of the Doha negotiation. There has been some progress, like in other areas, you know, not very complex. Through the exact definition of uh, what is uh, an environmental goods or service may lead to a bit of a technical discussion, but that's something which is perfectly doable in any circumstances. So those would be my sort of two recommendations at this stage. Well, thank you. Um, so we've turned to our second topic, uh, which has to do with the potential of exploiting the trading system uh, in order to uh, mitigate climate uh, change. And Madam President, uh, um, uh, from your vantage point, uh, what do you think the major challenges are in that regard? Yes, I think first we have to be clear when we talk about trade, more trade, this means normally more transport and more CO2 emissions. 
in the existing Kyoto Protocol, we have the challenge that uh, uh, shipping and aircraft is not included. So all transport of goods with these are, uh, 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 by shipping or the aircraft has a comparative advantage. This is actually trade distorting. So this is a challenge for the future climate convention that we have an equal treatment and no uh, 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 discrimination of the kind of transportation. Second, in trade, well, we discussed in Bali 2007 what trade could do to favor eco-friendly products and techniques. We presented a list. Uh, with the idea, okay, we could reduce tariffs on all these so-called eco-friendly products, then you would have, a, a, well, a quite a good market introduction. It would be, it would cost less, and you have also as a side effect the technology transfer. But today we don't have not even a definition. What is an eco-friendly product? What is an eco-friendly technique? And so we have to create a body or an organization who gives us the definition so that you can start and develop uh, internationally uh, accepted definition of eco-friendly uh, products. And well, we had the discussion, uh, well, uh, is this in favor only of industrialized countries because they have the technologies? So uh, 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 countries like India and others told us, well, this favors your economies, and we can't afford to buy these newest technologies. So when you want to create such a system, you have also to fix that every country can afford the newest technologies, that it's on the market, but also affordable for companies and for human beings. So uh, we we, we, we cut the, the technologies are available, but on the market you have to guarantee that also the normal consumer has access to it. So this is, on a trade perspective, quite a challenge to uh, create this. But it's possible. But I think first uh, comes really uh, a goal, what... Uh, do we achieve on the international level on climate change and then we can create uh, the trade measures uh, who can support all these climate change decisions. By the way, you mentioned just um, the, the difficulties of classifying different products as yeah. being eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. um, biofuels in particular have been rather a controversial uh, question and exactly. had, had, had Celso Amorin been here, I'm sure he would have reminded us about that. Um, the United States in particular has promoted biofuels with one hand and put an import tariff uh, on sugar uh, ethanol uh, coming uh, from uh, Brazil. So, so um, uh, where, do you, where do you think biofuels belong? Hmm. Uh, listen, I think, well, you can uh, produce bioethanol with different uh, uh, resources. And I think, well, we, I think we should allow any country to, to use its natural resources. We have the same problem with carbon, we have the same problem with palm oil. And when we would uh, discriminate in general, or think this is not allowed to produce that, I think that's not a way to have an international accepted solution. But we could encourage them to have new technologies that they, we have less CO2 emissions, that it is produced in a sustainable way, and then it could be acceptable for both sides. So I like the idea of carbon storage is today accepted. So also in Africa, they can use uh, the resources available, can develop and uh, have, uh, have uh, the possibilities uh, to have an uh, ec uh, economy based even on, on carbon. But technologies here uh, can be the solution. Anand Sharma, from where you sit, um, uh, both with respect to what happened in Copenhagen and this issue uh, of, um, of removing uh, uh, the, the obstacles to trade in uh, uh, eco-friendly products and services. Uh, we, what, is, what is your uh, sense of these issues? Let's uh, look at it in a very honest and objective manner. Not pre-Copenhagen or post-Copenhagen. The climate change issues were there even at the time of Kyoto Protocol. We know what happened to Kyoto Protocol and then the Bali Convention. Now it's very easy to make futuristic statements or recommendations. But 
ignoring the realities would be a blunder. The fact is that a large part of this planet is underdeveloped. Overwhelming majority of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, even in Asia, or South Americas and Caribbeans, do not have either the technology or the resources. There's poverty, there is hunger, pandemics, health issues, energy security issues. Even in countries, those who have vast natural resources, I feel that the discourse has to be very honest. You cannot completely have a divorce from immediate past and history. Then there cannot be honest discourse in the world. First of all, there has to be a fair admission that this situation has been brought about because of unsustainable matters of methods of production and consumption. Now the countries which are expected to respond, to go in for new technologies, good adaptation, mitigation, are not responsible for that. I'm not going to enter into a blame game what happened, because you cannot reverse the clock of history. What has happened has happened. For me, as a political leader, even this entire agreement on carbon credit was ethically indefensible. That the sinners would say, I have sinned, I have enough to pay, you pay for my sins. This is the truth, what it boils down to. You may negotiate any agreement. Now when we are talking of new technologies, should we approach this issue from a mercantile aspect, IPR aspect. I said today in the WTO ministers, ministerial that uh, when we talk of human intellect, particularly addressing critical challenges to the planet, what do we say? Should the human intellect or the creativity of humankind be used again for a fee or for the larger benefit of humankind? That's a fundamental question, which has not been addressed. Copenhagen has come out with a disappointing safe landing. Let's be honest. Let's not, you know, build it to something as if heavens have changed. Ink has not dried. We know how that understanding was brought about, thanks to the wisdom and sagacity of the leaders. I will give due credit to President Obama, but also to my Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, also to the Chinese Premier Wen Pao, and the Brazilians. That's how it came about. But everybody has said it's disappointing. Now, what are we going to do? When it comes to these technologies, it's very easy said than done. Doris, pardon my saying so, that these countries, where there is issue of food security and hunger, where there is issue of more people dying of hunger than of tuberculosis and HIV and malaria. What are we going to tell them? By the technology. We know that at the turn of the millennium, there was a millennium summit. MDG goals are being discussed in 2010. The developed and the rich countries were the beneficiaries of that period of industrialization and colonization. And benefits, I may be brutally frank again, the resources didn't come. The resources did come out of Asia and Africa and South America. How is the compensation being made? If these technologies are not being made available to a Lesotho or to Kenya or to Jamaica, free of cost. You have to make available, if you believe in the safety of the planet, these new technologies, you're right. Countries like China, India, Brazil, South Africa, we have scientific talent. We have built institutions on our own, not because of the largest of anyone. But we are in a position to be partners. But let's be very clear about the final roadmap that we will make available these technologies to poor countries. 
We will make available resource, uh, resources available to those who have nothing. Forget about adaptation, even for mitigation. Unless and until this larger question is addressed, it would be a meaningless discussion. You can have endless talking sessions. Well, the world is full of it because we have, this planet Earth has 192 countries in UN. We can talk and talk and talk. But are we going to address it honestly? Um, if it has to be addressed honestly, I strongly feel the transfer of technologies and resources to the poor countries should be the first on the agenda, not the last. Okay, so technology we, we understand. Um, other, and, and in fact, uh, didn't, there, were, uh, there was at least a beginning to deal with the obligations for financial transfers, presumably for technology and other purposes. That, that was part of, of what was agreed on in, in Copenhagen. Um, but I want to return... As I said, I don't want to turn the clock back. When it comes to compensation and finances, then, sorry to say, then that would be a larger debate. But don't, I want forget, to... don't forget the colonized countries have paid enough. But I would like to focus our discussion on the trade dimension. Yes, I'm looking at that. But trade must have a human dimension, not mercantile dimension. But what I would like to focus on is the issue of the trading system and how the, um, the, 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 the uh, um, efforts on the part of certain countries to deem what is comparable effort on the part of others might lead us into, into difficulties for the trading system. Uh, so um, from where you sit in India, um, I want to know uh, exactly how you feel about that particular question. Well, as far as we are concerned, we are committed to a rule-based, fair, equitable, multilateral trade regime, which honestly corrects the historical distortions and creates a level playing field. That's why we are also very much concerned and determined to take the Doha development round of the WTO to a logical conclusion and a fair and successful conclusion. Thank God that we had a rule-based multilateral trade organization in place. If we didn't have rule-based systems, 2008, 2009 in particular, would have been a nightmarish year for the world. We all know. Uh, today we have enough, I'm not a great economist, I'm only a political activist, that everybody is telling us what went wrong. None of them was there to tell us beforehand this is going to go wrong. The post-mortem can be done by anyone. What we are seeing is post-mortem, and the same pundits telling us now, they're not saying that we went wrong then. Now they're saying this is the right course. So we as institutions, leaders, sovereign nation states have to be careful while accepting, rejecting these inputs. The in, question, my, in my view, in today's context, if the global economy has to genuinely recover, because the present recovery is spoon-fed by stimulus. It's like the bottle feeding. And it is neither uniform nor universal. All the countries did not collapse. My country's banking system, financial system did not collapse. It imploded from the heart of the capitalist world. But, but I, want to, I, I'm no, sorry, I would like to take the conversation to trade. Yes, I'm talking of trade. Specifically with respect to climate change. Well, you, uh, but, okay, but, I'll answer yeah. that. Specifically now, we are making a big mistake to compartmentalize issues. Whether it's food security and hunger, health security, climate change, energy security. They have to be addressed together. The future generations will not forgive the leaders of today if we compartmentalize and don't address them together. We talk of a globalized world, a wired world. Are these issues unlinked? Let me ask anyone. So who is saying that there's no okay. interrelation? Uh, uh, Pascal Lamy, and, and then um, Madam President. Two, two very uh, short uh, contributions at this stage of the discussion. First, a note, a note of caution on this notion that trade is terrible for climate uh, because of transport. 
Uh, first, there are many cases where trade contributes to a more efficient allocation of resources, including carbon emissions. Second, 90% of world trade is uh, shipped, and shipping is not the greatest uh, contributor to carbon emissions, although there are other greenhouse gases from shipping. Third, at the end of the day, if we have the right price for carbon, transport will integrate the right price for carbon, which is, I think, the real ultimate uh, we need to have. Second, uh, just for sort of inputting the discussion, we have a precedent of a trade and environment issue with the Montreal Protocol on CFCs. At the time, there was a multilateral agreement that led to a limitation of emission of CFCs. There was, within this protocol, a disposition that border tax adjustments could take place under some conditions. There was a financing mechanism that helped developing countries reaching their goals. At the end of the day, there was no problem with trade. None of the trade enforcement dispositions of the Montreal Protocol was ever enforced. Because the existence of a multilateral framework plus the financing created a situation where this notion that there would be a cheater somewhere that somebody would be free riding disappeared. And at the end of the day, this is what we need to reach. And do you think we will? I mean, I'm not sure we will, <laughs> but I'm sure we've got to try. And I'm sure that, again, from the WTO point of view, this should be our major objective for the moment. Doris? <laughs> I think perhaps to integrate a little bit uh, on Anand's concerns about these, uh, uh, well, uh, priorities, let's say, uh, on, on poverty reduction and on climate change and allowing also to have growth and development of economies. I think in the, cl in, in the climate convention, it's clear uh, the principle that we have a global but uh, uh, differentiated responsibility. That's clear for us. And that's ex exactly an element which is in WTO also a principle. We have in the trade system, we have, we have goals, and then industrialized countries have to do more. Least developed countries have preferential treatment. It's, it's a system which really recognizes that not all countries of the world have the uh, equal possibilities. So that's my point that I think when we also include the technology transfer in a tariff system, uh, it can be also there recognized even perhaps with access for free for the LDCs or with, uh, with a reflection about these possibilities uh, every country has. Uh, I think this is exactly what WTO could as a system, as a systemic procedure, contribute to the climate convention of the future. That's my first point. My second point would be what we have to think about is that we also in WTO would eliminate subsidies to harmful uh, 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 techniques, to harmful subsidies uh, on a, from a climate uh, change perspective. Coming back to biofuel, this would be perhaps one that we eliminate subsidies for, for producing bioethanol. It's on the market, but it can't be subsidized. This could be a reflection on WTO in the future when we agree, uh, we allowed it, but it's actually harmful uh, for, of, from a climate change perspective. So this must be a future discussion, in my view. Uh, but for that, we need the climate convention with the principles. We need experts who give us advice how to define uh, uh, eco-friendly product systems. And we need time. I fully agree. These are long-time procedures, long-time goals. And the multilateral organizations need to closely cooperate. For the moment, I see too many conferences 
with specialists on either uh, financing, either uh, environmental ministers, uh, but to match them together would be also a challenge and a need, otherwise we can't tackle the different systems together. Would you add, you know, you, you mentioned the, diff the, the issue of identifying these, these bio-friendly uh, kinds of products, but actually we know a lot of um, products that are not friendly, particularly fossil fuels. And all around the world, we have subsidies programs where countries are actually subsidizing both consumption and production of fossil fuels. Would you, would you add that to the list? I think it has to be discussed, yes. Well, well for Switzerland, we, we discuss about uh, subsidies to agriculture because we all agree that's wrong if we want to have a chance also for uh, largely depending agriculture markets in Africa or in other parts of the world. So, this must be a part of the solution, and therefore I think uh, even if it's difficult, even if uh, uh, it, it worries some, some countries, we have to tackle this discussion. Uh, Rashid? Uh, well, Bob, I'd like just to, to focus on, I think, what you're trying really to, to get out of the session is, is what is the interaction, what, what is the link uh, between trade and, and climate change Post Copenhagen and, and considering all all the, the the events that have been unfolding in the last few years, let me just uh, tell you a few 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 points. One, I personally believe that to to use trade as a significant tool in terms of achieving uh, the climate change objective of the world today, we need to finalize negotiation on liberalisation and eliminating distortion from existing international trade. Because the more liberalized it is, the less distortion you have, you will have a more, more effective system that you can use to promote and uh, uh, implement a climate change agenda. If you already today suffer from a significant distortion that exists, and this is at the heart of the negotiation uh, of the Doha round that we are having today, whether in agriculture, or in, uh, in, in uh, manufactured goods. It is very difficult to assume that within such a distortion system, you can have a very effective arrangement for climate change. That is going to be extremely complicated, very difficult, and you'll have a lot of neg negativeness coming out of it. Not because of the climate change objective, but because that is going to reflect the, 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 the feelings of, of unfairness that exist among many of the players. So I think that's one thing. The second point, which is very important, we need to agree, and that we have discussed today as Minister of Trade with Pascal Lamy in the meetings we had. We need to have a framework. Well, fine, you know, we, we have a very lively and good discussion taking place on the climate change. We have Copenhagen. We agree, some of us, that we are moving in the right direction. But we need to create a framework where we can negotiate, regulate, and observe the trade side of it. We cannot just leave it uh, the way it is at the moment. Otherwise, we can have chaos. And, and you, some of the concern we are having now, which have been reflected in the last 50 minutes, you can imagine how it is uh, across the world when it will come really to, to, to different position of countries, economies, and trade. We need to uh, make uh, uh, an agreement, an arrangement for a, a framework how to do that. And from my point of view, we need probably three urgent matters at the moment to put them on the agenda. And they have been mentioned. The border tax adjustment, we, we need that, that is definitely you know, something that we need to accept, that there is a need for rationale, a need to set the fair price, a need for a mechanism. I think the WTO can and should be able uh, uh, to handle uh, this within the existing provisions. Or if that, that needs some amendment, we need to look at that. We, we need to look at an agreement on, on the list uh, related to environmental goods and services that we'd like to promote. And I think this is something that maybe we can start with, even if we don't have full agreement. And we need to start tackling the issue of transport. We know that Kyoto excluded that. We know that more than 70, uh, 70 75 percent uh, of the emission is coming from land transportation. The rest is 11 percent each. Uh, we need to tackle that. So that's my personal view about the interaction between trade and climate. Well, I trade. thought that was a, a great summary. Uh, so I think we have uh, plenty of uh, people in the audience who are <coughs> extremely knowledgeable on this question. So let's take some, some questions. Uh, anyone wanting to start, please, sir. Uh, just, just before, I, uh, bef before I invite you to speak, let me just 
make it clear that um, what we're looking for are to have as, as many people participate. So we'd really like short, sharp questions. Uh, identify yourself and say who you'd like to answer your question, please. Okay, help is on the way. Thank you. Uh, Burton Picard from Switzerland. Uh, the question is addressed for the entire panel. Uh, if we go back to your link between trade and climate change, and you exclude transport, which is, I believe, a detail, the main problem, I believe, is when you have a country producing dirty and cheap products that are imported into a country that is used to produce clean and expensive products of the same kind. How can you solve that issue without any protectionism? Well, focused question. Uh, Anand Sharma? You see, it's not a question of protectionism. It's a question of whether you live on one planet or not. <laughs> when there are countries which have been robbed of their resources and riches, who have minerals which those countries which may have technologies don't have even those resources. How would you compensate them in the current context if you want to save the planet? By giving them not only technologies but also resources. Second is who determines environmental goods? Uh, is in the 21st century world going to enter into another situation like at the time of after the arrival of the steam engine when the poor nations of the world, those who are struggling, and fortunately India and China and Brazil are not in that league today, will be denied that and will be condemned to be perpetuated in poverty and lack of development. The fundamental ethical questions which needs to be addressed. Are we going to address this question of climate change purely from commercial angle and mercantile greed or beyond that connected to humankind? And let me also quickly add one sentence here which has not been adequately addressed. On the issue of biofuels, biofuels, yes, because we, everything comes from nature. Whether nuclear energy or fossil fuels, everything mother planet feeds. Your cement, steel, everything, if it's not mother nature, nothing comes out without that. But the issue is, when you have one billion people denied of food security, what could be defined as biofuels? Conversion of grain for ethanol or molasses for ethanol. I know Brazil has enough molasses. I have not heard of a shortage. Sugar is an issue, but people have sweeteners. There's no shortage of rum in the world, but there's shortage of food. Can you convert, divert grain to feed a vehicle or a SUV or to feed human beings? It's a fundamental question. I don't think this debate, I'm not talking of this debate, is addressing these issues. And that's my concern. Uh, Pascal Lamy, on this quickly, well, and then we'll yeah, take to, another question. To try and answer this question very, very briefly, although it's a formidably complex question, uh, <laughs> uh, just clean and dirty import or export. Huh? The, the answer to, the, to your question is, we have a system in the World Trade Organization to address this sort of problem. We have rules, we have a an agreement on technical barriers to trade, we have an agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary standards, we have general provisions in the agreements on goods that basically allow country to protect their environment through trade measures. So it's not either or, it's not just you know free trade and if not everything free trade, it's protectionism. It's not protectionism, it's protection. Now, whether a protection is protectionist is something which the rules of the system allow you to determine. And if it's not clear, and let's recognize it's not always 100% clear, then we have a system of peer review, discussing it between our members, and at the end of the day, there's a litigation system. Those of you who want to know how it works, go to our website and look at the appellate body decision last year on a case between the European Union and Brazil on imports of retreated tires. 
which is precisely the sort of good which Sorry, I think... Could you, could you just say that again? I didn't catch it, so I'm sure many didn't. The imported? The case was whether Brazil could legitimately, as per WTO rules, prevent EU exports into Brazil of retreated tires. The notion being that retreated tires have an environmental component because when you leave them aside, it's a terrible nest for, Mexi for mosquitoes and so on. So I'm just giving this example rather than a long lecture on you know, where the compatibility is. We have a system that does that. OK, please. Uh, I'm Nancy Birdsell, Center for Global Development in Washington. And perhaps this question is too out of the box, but uh, we have been thinking about and working on the issue of the carbon trading market and the need for carbon price, implicit or explicit, to have that, those trades operate well. And just thinking to the point that the president made about the silos, I guess my question is maybe for Pascal Ami, maybe for Achim Steiner, to what extent do you think it would help you cope with what is still a rather primitive discussion in, on what to do about the trading system with respect to climate if there were more progress on the carbon trading market in the, in the, amongst the climate uh, group? And to what, how, it's very um, difficult, even, for, even thinking about it for me, and I, I have sort of, you know, I'm past kindergarten on the trade and WTO issues and the climate and carbon trading issues, but the, the siloing of those two conversations, both of which are quite primitive, is really a big concern for anyone who has some sympathy with the points Mr. Sharma is making but also wants to see some clarity and some progress in, on, the, on the steps, the details, to get some incremental progress on this morass of issues. I hope that that's okay. reasonably Akin clear. Akin Steiner, let me, let me ask you to take a first. Is um, carbon trading, uh, is it too primitive, or does it have great pr um, um, potential? Not the trading itself being primitive, but the discourse. OK, the discourse over trading. Are we ready yet for carbon trade? Let me first of all say something that um, you know, increasingly preoccupies me because the environmental agenda, which actually has broadened from a discourse, analytical, and policy point of view for the last 40 years, is very often still described as if it was at the point where you, know, you were hugging a tree. <laughs> and I just want to make it very clear, the driver of much of what is now on the global agenda of transforming our economy, be it in the energy, mobility, agriculture field, actually has a lot to do with the understanding of what is happening to the natural capital on this planet, as Mr. Sharma referred to. So please, let us not put the environmental perspective into that narrow box, because I would say to you, 30 years from now, you will have two very powerful ministries in a country. One is the finance minister who will look after financial capital. The other one will be the environment minister who is actually looking after natural capital. Now, if you start from that point of view, <laughs> then yes, the discussion about carbon is remarkably primitive. But why is it? Because it is being contained out of fear of what you will do to a market, an economy, an industry, a sector, if you introduce a new price signal. And this is one of the fascinating things, because our economies have always moved, in a sense, through shock sometimes, and not always by design. The problem that we're confronted with right now is the reality of history, the legacy, in a race against time in terms of the ability of nation states to deal with carbon emissions. And we can spend forever talking about, is it cap and trade? Is it a carbon tax? Is it this particular issue? Is it that leakage? I would rather suggest, and this is where I think it is not a singular reality anymore, either in the developed or in the developing world. And I believe that much of what the carbon discussion is about is trying to figure out a way in which we can make a transformation and nobody gets hurt. The problem is, in the real world, that is very difficult to achieve. And that is why one shouldn't fault the process. And let me add one more thing, because 
let's talk about reality for a moment. Where I live, which is where you know, the World Community put the headquarters of the United Nations Environment Programme, five decades after independence, 10% of the population has access to electricity. The entire 40 million people of Kenya have 1,300 megawatts of installed electricity. To argue that the current development model of technology diffusion or any other kind of trade or development cooperation policy has succeeded in addressing a fundamental right, which is access to energy, is simply not credible. And that is why I would put forward, and that's why we in UNEP have put also the context of the green economy at the center stage, which is my answer to your issue. We are looking at the transformation of making our economies more efficient, less polluting, and that means making quantum leaps forward in energy terms. And an economy like Kenya sits already on three to 4,000 megawatts of proven geothermal power. And in fact, there has been a geothermal power station working in that country for 25 years. Neither the government, neither the international community, nor the private sector were able to build on that experience. It took only one legislative act in parliament, sovereign parliament of Kenya, to introduce a feed-in tariff. And within six months, the largest wind power farm is put as a consortium on its track. The tragedy may be, and this is where we come back to finance, that in order to build that 350 megawatt wind power farm in a perfect area for Kenya, is that you have to also pay for connecting it to the national grid. Now, where is all that money that could help Kenya make a quantum leap in less than 12 months to put a whole new technology generation in place and just needs to have that cost of initially putting that link into the national grid into position. And this is where the climate negotiations have almost taken an absurd turn, because we now have $30 billion promised as a quick start facility. I could point to you three times over where you could spend that in Africa tomorrow. And yet, we continue a debate that is too abstract and too compartmentalized about carbon trading regimes, because all we are focused on is how to protect individual national and sectoral interests instead of looking how a green economy approach could actually take us all forward. Thank you. Please, sir. My name is Dan Esty. I'm a professor at Yale. Um, we've heard that the Doha round is struggling, the climate change negotiations moving slowly. Sometimes that argues for narrowing the agenda, trying to find small steps to move forward with. In other cases, it argues for bringing together perhaps uh, unrelated issues or seemingly unrelated or only slightly related into some grand coalition or grand bargain opportunity. And I wonder any of the panelists think that might be the case here with trade and the environment. So if we, if we have two uh, agreements where we seem a little stuck, let's just combine the two and see what we get. Uh, Pascal Lamy, we want to make your life a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the notion that... Uh, or, yeah, or the other twice, way around. Uh, twice yeah. talk, <laughs> once sold. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting uh, academic idea, which I've been playing with uh, myself sometimes in academic circles, not before the General Council of the WTO. <laughs> uh, the problem is... Uh, where would be the trade-off? And I don't see much of a trade-off between these two issues. I see lots of trade-off within these two issues. And by the way, there already is a legal bridge between trade opening and environmental protection, including CO2 emissions. So we, we, we don't need this bridge to be built. Uh, others would say we don't have a bridge like this in social standards. True. Others would say uh, we have a bridge like this with uh, trade and intellectual property. True. We have the bridge for environment. Nobody can say, oh, Trump's, uh, trade trumps environment or environment trumps trade. So we, we already have this architecture. Now, the reasons why uh, there was not a full agreement in Copenhagen, and the reason why we still have sort of 20% of the do around to do are just because of domestic vested interest problems. Uh, and the capacity of 
leader X or leader Y to do a, a trade-off at international level is extremely closely linked to the capacity he or she has to do this trade-off at home. So my simple answer, if, uh, if parliaments could negotiate with parliaments, maybe a global deal of this kind would make sense. But that's not the case. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Now I'll get you. Uh, Christopher Logan from Hong Kong. Uh, I was going to ask a, a question about the future and maybe think forward five, ten years and think about how uh, global trade can actually be a contributor to sustainability. Um, think of it in terms of a, a low carbon globalization. Because as, as we look back the last 10, 20 years, the good work for the WTO, um, you know, foreign direct investment, improved inf information, uh, manufacturing quality, all of these things have combined to allow uh, retailers and manufacturers, mainly in the developed world, to outsource production to the, the, the emerging markets. And those, the, the new developments tended to be in locations with low input costs, so low labor costs, low land costs, low taxation, and so on. And that's where you have the rise of, of India for certain services and manufacturing in China. So the, the question is, given that we've been able to, to drive production to the, to the lowest cost, and we've done that very, very effectively as, as, as businesses, can we set up a slightly new s environment where the future drives us towards the most sustainable locations? So for power intensive uh, uh, production, you go to where the source of the sustainable power is, not to where the, the, the cheap energy is, and, 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 and so on. But I think it requires a new policies and new structures. And, and have, have you thought about that or anybody incorporating those into your longer term mm -hmm. visions? Please. That's the exactly very important question we discussed before, because for us, well, I, when I talk with entrepreneurs, that's exactly what I hear. Uh, well, we, you have the pressure to be uh, cost uh, uh, effective, so you, you decide to, to, to transfer your business towards the low income country. I, I understand. For us, it's a challenge. We want to have competition. But in parliaments, we have more and more the discussion. Well, uh, when we negotiate, for example, free trade agreements, why can't we demand from our partners that they also accept at least several social and environmental standards? So that uh, the entrepreneurs having uh, uh, their business in Europe are not discriminated uh, towards uh, the production in low income, income countries. That's exactly a challenge. Uh, I think we just can't solve these problems by discussing after Doha, probably also after a, a new climate convention, that we talk about standards. In environmental issues, we don't have any, practically any, uh, standards who are internationally recognized. We have a little bit about tropical forests, perhaps uh, a little bit then after Copenhagen, acceptable standards, but as long as we don't have standards, we not even can refer to them. And as a company, it's clear you have to do, do business, so you, you have the, the pressure also from the shareholders that you go towards uh, the low-income countries, and well, I think what can help, we have uh, from the United Nations the global compact. So the multi, the big companies, I think, they refer more and more also to uh, company standards where they produce in Bangalore or in in Cairo or in Paris. It's the same company level they uh, fulfill all over the world. This would be another approach that we, we work towards standards on a company level. But at the end of the day, it's a question of costs. And for me, it's a question of standards, internationally recognized standards. Anand Sharma, you want to have a quick comment on this? No, I don't have any you know, principal disagreement, because we all know it's a matter of shared global concern. But also, uh, we have accepted the principle, as uh, Doris herself had said earlier, of common but differentiated responsibility. But what I want this entire audience to know when we are talking of the introduction of new technologies, which are eco-friendly, or geotechnologies, 
clean development mechanisms, innovation, a lot of investment will go in. There are institutions, I have no doubt in my mind, that for decades to come, America and Europe will be a leader in the innovation or development of new technologies. With some of the other countries being very much there, including China, India, Brazil, will definitely be there. No doubt in that, in innovation as well as in production. What the world needs today is an honest partnership to help everyone. You need an approach which is fair and equitable and honest because you cannot compensate adequately for what has happened. Even this, as I've mentioned earlier, because I don't want to expand more, uh, compulsions force governments, negotiators, to reach agreements which ethically may not be correct, but, but planet Earth needs it, so you say, all right, carbon credit. They've said it, that you're telling the poor, I have sinned, I did all this, now, you continue to be good. I'll continue to be the what I was. I'll give you this credit. Now, this is the truth. What is the cost of the induction of new technologies? Has anybody discussed this in the global context? I don't see any fair calculation having been made, even in the uh, United States of America or Europe. It's easier said than done. New technologies. What's the cost to replace the existing technologies? Even for the calibrated induction between now and 2030, minimum amount required will be $10 trillion in the developed world itself every year, if not $15 trillion between now and 2030. A country like India itself is expected to spend $700 billion. Therefore, I am talking of a global partnership where we address these issues in, gen in a genuinely fair manner. Let me turn, uh, sir, you've been quite patient. Yeah, to you. Thank you. I wanted to, <coughs> Daniel Gross, Center for European Policy Studies. I wanted to follow up a remark by Steiner and Lamy on the importance of price signals. And the last question uh, already told us Competition leads to uh, relocating production to where it's cheapest. Cheapest, of course, from a private cost perspective, not from what is the cost for the planet. And in order to have that uh, in, taken into account by private uh, production, we need to have a price signal. And this price signal is important if we have differences in the carbon intensity of production, which is around four to five times higher in China than in Europe or the US. Now, the reality is that at present, we have a price signal for carbon in one area of the world, namely the EU. We have one planned, probably coming, in the US. Now, in this context, the question of uh, border measures is simply, do we want to extend this price signal, which is so important, to at least part of the rest of the world, which uh, exports products into these areas where we have a price signal? Now, the concrete question I have is the following. Let's assume the EU had a carbon import tariff, which is basically a carbon content times the price of a permit. And the EU takes these receipts from this import uh, tax and rebates it to the country of origin for quick start measures or anything else that helps the environment. Would that raise objections from the two ministers present here or from the head of the WTO? Anyone want to take the question? Would, would, any of the two ministers? So you, you're going to be taxed, but you're going to get the money back. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll just tackle that point, and uh, my colleagues can also uh, respond. But you know, you are thinking innovatively about how, how can we address the issue of uh, border tax adjustments. Fine. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, your idea makes sense uh, that might uh, encourage some people. But, you know, that's our biggest concern, that ideas like this will start to fly, and then somebody <laughs> will, will pick them up, and, uh, and, and then a decision will be taken not necessarily having proper engagement and driven, frankly speaking, okay. in spirit by some protectionist measures, because there is a sense of unfairness. We can, we can you know, we can sense it in many of the meetings. People in developed countries, they feel that this is unfair that our labor and our companies will have to compete with you companies 
in emerging markets that you do not respect the environment and do not, do not respect you know, social and, 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 and. On the other hand, you heard my friend and colleague Anand and myself talking the other side of the unfairness, that you know, we cannot sit on the other side of the equation, being exploited for hundreds of years, giving you know, other people given the chance to do whatever they wanted, and now they come and try to teach everybody else morality. So that, that is you know, the environment we want to exclude from that decision. We understand that you know, trade at the end of the day has to be fair. We committed to that. We committed. We are a very active, committed players in the WTO and the principles of the WTO, with everything that Pascal said about the hierarchy and the principles that have been set there. The challenge we all have is how to get there, coming from different places. And, and that is why I raised that issue from the beginning of the session, that there is a concern about the process itself and the fairness and the balance of it. You cannot make everybody happy, that's for sure. And trade is always sensitive because it deals with jobs, and jobless people are a very bad thing for politicians. So, so, so it becomes a very irritating issue for politics and for society. So all what we are saying here, and I do respect your idea, and I think there is a lot of merit in thinking about similar ideas. Let's agree that there should be a framework, there should be some clear regulation, and there should be some control on that. Thank you. Um, Pascal Ami, you wanted to come in? No. Yeah. OK. Um, we on, on we only have time, unfortunately, for one more question. Madam, uh, well, there's a gentleman there, and then I'm going to turn to. OK. Uh, we'll do you, and then the gentleman with the, with the South African scarf. Thank oh, you very much. Me. My name is Alicia Barcena. I'm the head of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. I want to raise the following question to both probably Pascal and, and Akin Steiner. The origin of the two, let's say, processes of negotiation, environmental and trade, became very tension. Uh, there was a lot of tension between the two of them, basically because in 1992, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities applied to the environmental but not to trade. Now, here we are, and we are talking about three forms of trade, I guess. One is the trade that involves goods and services that could be, in a certain way, uh, protectionist uh, in terms of, for example, if a country wants to uh, export uh, copper, maybe the buyer is going to impose a protectionist measure because of the process or whatever. The second one is the trade of environmental goods and services, which is a totally different cup of tea. And the third one is the carbon trade. And I think that uh, we, we cannot solve all the problems of life with, with, the, you know, with the climate change issue. But what I do think is that we need your guidance to know what is the roadmap between now, Mexico, and South Africa to see if we can come out with a very specific type of framework, agreement, what have you, maybe in the sort of the Montreal Protocol. But we need the two of you and, the, and your two constituencies to sit together which have refused to do it in, 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 in the evolution of time. Because I remember okay. the WTO debates. So let's hear debates. what they have to say. WTA debates, they said, we don't want the environmental people here. So what are we going to do now in, right. the, in the next two years? Well, Pascal already alluded to it. We lived through a time when the debate was all about you know, which regime trumps which regime. And I think we have moved beyond that. And what we are both. Uh, trying to articulate an understanding of how you would ensure that is how through an enhanced trade regime, a successful conclusion of the Doha round, accompanied by one of the most significant signals into our economy as we know it today, which is the climate change negotiation, do you, in a sense, leverage or condition one success upon another, which is trade can be an accelerator of diffusion. I go back to the example of Kenya. You can have the entire electricity supply of Kenya totally carbon neutral within the next 10 years, or you can continue to keep that country hostage to a world market of oil and fossil fuel supplies where the economics is ruining the country's ability to operate. So it is not a choice between the status quo is better than taking a risk. Now, the difficult issue is, and this is where the space, the political space, has to be broadened. And here, in particular, I look to your two portfolios as ministers, it has been far easier to bring the climate change and environmental rationale into a more pragmatic and rational view of trade regimes than it has been to, in a sense, allow the trade agenda to look at environment not as the constraint, 
but perhaps as an accelerator in this process. And, you know, I cannot solve the problem of legacy. You are absolutely right. But you cannot hold, you know, a vast part of the world hostage to the legacy issue when it actually has very real opportunities in the economy of today with the technologies available and the emerging finance mechanisms. And here, I agree very much with Mr. Sharma, the financial equation has been dishonest in the climate context. Pascal Ami? Well, uh, first, uh, Akim and myself, we've been sitting together on this issue, and we published within our limited executive authority with some feathers a bit ruffled here and there, a joint report on <laughs> trade and climate change. Why did we do that? To provide our respective constituencies with the pieces of thought they should play with. His organization is member-driven. My organization is member-driven. It happens to be the same members. Should, shouldn't be any coherence problem. The reality <laughs> is that we have to help them doing that. And it's not a commercial, but those of you who haven't yet made up their minds on this issue of climate change versus trade, please read this. It's not, the answer is not that's what you should think. You've got the bits and pieces. Finally, as an example, uh, I, of course, would nev should never answer in public any question of whether this measure should be WTO compatible or not. My, my lawyers have always told me the only thing you're allowed to answer is it depends. <laughs> so that's the answer. It depends. But, but I have a question for you, and I don't need a public answer to that. Let's assume your European BTA is based on the idea that the f carbon footprint of an import has to be taxed because it's not as good as your domestic production, which I understand is the underlying assumption. Would you be ready if the carbon footprint of what you import in Europe is better than your domestic production to transform this into an import subsidy? <laughs> Good question. Please, I, I know you want to come in. Uh, just a quick comment. On this entire issue of carbon intensity, please uh, let's go back and reflect on it. Carbon intensity of goods or carbon intensity of countries? Because even the city of New York burns more electricity throughout the night than what would light an entire country in sub-Saharan Africa or a poorer country in Asia. It's a fundamental question. When you link the two, it becomes very disturbing. If we are really concerned about the environment and the climate change, I go back to what I had said. Can you compartmentalize only to goods production? And who is going to determine the intensity? Overlooking. Forget about the blame game. I'm not entering into that. Like Pascal Ami said, he's a lawyer and he consults lawyers. I also trained as a lawyer. But I'm not talk talking here as a lawyer. I'm arguing as a political activist who is connected with the emotions and sentiments. Putting things in a historical perspective doesn't mean that we are in a mode of confrontation or a blame game. So therefore, I leave this question rather, that can you address this issue honestly without eradicating poverty and hunger from this planet? Is poverty more polluting than this entire debate? Thank you. And the final question, sir. Lars Joseph on Vattenfall, Sweden. Um, as I understand it, we trade because that lowers the cost and we get more prosperous everybody, so everybody gains from it. Then I would say the border tax adjustment issue we should take away from the table immediately because it's very negative and costly to everyone. And uh, I think we should face that we live in an in unjust world, world and um, we can take that. Bearing in mind then if we want to solve the climate change issue, which I think we want, then everybody basically needs to be under a carbon regime at least post-2020. So these 20, 10 years that we have in front of us, I think we can live with a little 
injustice when it comes to export import. But then to my question, because I believe that if we connect carbon, uh, the climate change with the trade, of course, the real lever is when we can trade carbon. And if we then see the post-2020 period, and if we say that, and I fully agree with Mr. Sharma, that of course India, India's population and the poor people need to have the opportunity to develop. So of course these countries should have plenty of headroom in the carbon regime. But okay, if we do that, then of course you can trade. And I would, my question would be, would you see that as an advantage? And of course my question is, is then to, to Mr. Rashid and Mr. Sharma. Well, well uh, let sorry. me, sorry Rashid. Uh, let me tell you, we are 17% of the world's population. And in future, one fifth of the world's population, 20% of the world's children live in my country. They will increase the demographic profile. When it comes to energy intensity, India has only 4% share of the world's energy generation. Even the United Kingdom, where the population is 58 million, we are 1.1 billion, has 12 times more energy and carbon intensity. And we have given an honest commitment to the world, not now pre-Copenhagen or post-Copenhagen. We said in 2006, at no stage of our development, India's GHG emissions will ever cross the lower threshold of the global average. What more commitment can we make? Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid that we have to end this discussion. I, uh, I feel that um, this distinction uh, which uh, Minister Sharma made between the carbon intensity of the goods and services and the carbon intensity of countries is really a critical one. And it seems to me, just speaking personally, that what our mission really has to be is to have an agreement and a set of agreements that deals with the carbon intensity of countries. And if we are able to do that, we can then allow goods and services to uh, circulate freely. So uh, I think that's the central ta takeaway for me. Uh, I, I, I come out of this thinking that um, this is what we need to be aiming at, and we've heard from our, our panelists that it's eminently doable. This is, uh, we have the, as, as Pascal Ami mentioned, we have the example of the Montreal Protocol where we've seen how this could operate in a, even in a slightly fragmented fashion. Hopefully what we can do uh, looking into the future is to get a more integrated solution so that we don't have to uh, put trade and climate as opponents, but rather can exploit their complementarities. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the panel for an excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you.